we'll just hand it off to our own Adam Garrett Clark to talk to us about how to edit videos. Thank you. Okay, uh, is everybody looking at my screen right now? Can you yes. see my screen? Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, hey everybody. Um, this is my little uh, mini film course for you all. Um, I, I'm thinking about this as video production uh, rather than video editing because I think um, editing is one facet. It's an important facet of the whole process. Um, but it is very specific to where you are deciding to do your, your video. Um, is it TikTok? Is it YouTube? Is it Instagram? There's going to be some different um, scenarios there as far as that piece of editing. So um, yeah, let me just, let's jump in. Uh, all right, OK. So why, why am I talking to you guys about this? Why did Phoenix ask me to do this? Well, I, I do happen to be a little bit of a, a documentary nerd. Um, I did study journalism in college um, at a film school. And um, uh, after college, I basically have volunteered at Sundance Film Festival. It's the, one of the big, large, largest independent film festivals in Utah, um, basically every year since I graduated college. I missed a couple, but I've gone for 12 years. Um, and if you're interested, it's, it's a pretty fun experience. It's like adult, wonder, adult uh, theme park for, um, for film nerds. And uh, you know, you get a free place to stay. You get to see as many. I would go and watch as many documentaries as I could per day. Sometimes that might be four in a day. Um, and um, I also have worked on a few documentaries in my day. Um, ha I would love to, if I could get make a living doing that. I would. I'm I'm an '80s baby, so I grew up watching HBO and TV. Um, and I think a lot of the folks. Uh, if you're younger than me, you're you're even more um, digitally literate and and more of a storyteller. So I think you know the sad thing for me once I graduated college was that uh, I realized that everybody was a filmmaker, everybody was a writer, and uh, it was a little hard to make a living doing that. Um, but that is that is also a beautiful thing, especially with the latest technology. We're all storytellers, um, and so. Um, the phone is one of the big, the phone and the internet obviously are, are kind of the big technological shifts that have allowed that to happen. Uh, in fact, I, I own uh, two overpriced, very expensive cameras and I don't use them. Most of the projects that I do now, I use my iPhone. Um, and there is actually professional films at, that have made it in film festivals that were shot totally on the phone. And the technology is only getting better and better, and it's very user friendly. A lot of these platforms like TikTok and Instagram um, and iMovie, you know, it's making it a lot easier um, and allowing all of us to become storytellers. Um, so let's see here. So I wanted to play you. I'm going to play you a couple little little ditties, a couple little videos throughout this presentation, um, and. Um, I'm also going to give you some practical tips, but uh, indulge me for a second while I um, weave a little narrative for you. So let's see. Hello, my name is Yuval Noah Harari. I'm a historian, and I would like to talk to you about how we humans conquered the world. Humans have been around for millions of years. See that little group over there? They are our very distant ancestors. Their behavior looks kind of familiar, don't you think? But they weren't very different from gorillas, elephants, or birds. There was nothing special about these early humans. They were insignificant animals minding their own business in a corner of Africa. There was no sign that one day they would conquer and transform the whole world. This graphic novel explains how these insignificant apes acquired godlike powers and became the rulers of planet Earth. All right. So um, let's get back to my presentation here. Um, yeah, so I wanted to share that because this is one of my favorite books. Um, and I think it's required reading. I think we should all Read this book. Our speakers really don't need any introduction, so I'm really actually not going to oh, give them an introduction. My, uh... um, 
but it just Sorry, to say got my YouTube. Um, what I was saying is that this is Sapiens is a wonderful book. It's about the, the history of us, of Homo sapiens. It covers a long time span. And one of the big takeaways that, um, that came out for me in reading that book um, is, is the story about uh, the beginning of our species. So a lot of times we think that there was Homo sapiens and then there was Neanderthals and then there was Homo erectus and all, and it was like the succession of different human forms. Actually, the reality is that there was a bunch of these human forms all living together at the same time. So there was Neanderthals, there was Homo sapiens, there was Homo erectus, all these different human types were all together. But right now, the only human form that exists is Homo sapiens. So what happened? What, how, where did all those other human forms go? And this, the answer that, that you come to when you read this book is that Somehow we either, Homo sapiens, we either outlasted, outsurvived the other human forms, or we killed them off. But we did it because of storytelling. We were, our superpower as human beings is to take an idea and share it amongst a lot of other people and make things happen. So um, this, in my mind, is, oh, I can play it here. Cool. Um, this is the most important... Um, Hello, my name is Yuval oh, Noah Harari. Sorry. I'm a historian and I... Okay, anyway, this is one of the most important um, superpowers of our species. Stories are what make things happen. I think a lot of us were, were moved by some of the things that Nita B was saying. Um, that's how things get done and, and um, for better or, or for worse in the human world. So um, this is an important skill set to learn. So, all right, I'm going to shut up for a second. And uh, can you guys throw in the chat or popcorn style, tell me if you've got a video that you've been thinking about wanting to do um, and tell us a bit about what, why you feel it's an important video to, to, to do or a story you want to tell and maybe spit out some roadblocks, um, things that are holding you back. Adam? Yeah. Okay. Hey, so I just did a video on TikTok. It was my first one ever. And um, it was three minutes on global warming. And it was, I thought it was, it was pretty good for my first time. It just my timing, like I, I got cut off at the end. I wasn't really, you know, sure how to say things. And, um, I mean, I had a lot to learn. I have a lot to learn as far as like presentation and how to make an effective video. I think for a homegrown one, it wasn't that bad, but I think that it could use, you know, some some technical upgrades and yeah. some skills in, in presenting. Awesome, thank you, Hannah. Uh, yeah, I think in a lot of ways, this um, the skill set is, is very related to just the, the skill of, of giving a good presentation, which we've, we've gone over some of that stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll get into some, some practical tips for you on, on that. Um, let's see, I see Mitzi says, I made a video on social media at a KQED teacher training. It was awesome, easier than I thought. That's great. Um, yeah, you know, that, we'll get into that as well, Mitzi. Uh, the name of the game is keep it small, keep it easy, get it done from start to finish. Don't, make, don't do what I do, which is make it a big project that you never finish. Um, and then you start to build confidence and you start to build um, you know, an understanding of how you can improve and make it better. So keep doing it. It's all about repetition. Um, Phoenix says, what to create a TikTok series called It's Time to Save the World about how ludicrous my job is. Not sure how to edit the video. Also don't have good... Lighting framing background, awesome. Um, so yeah, to speak on that real quick, Phoenix, I think um, you wanna, just like you, you pointed out that, that great um, series, I think it's, what is it, uh, A Black Forager? And um, there's a lot of great videos like that out there. One pattern that you'll notice is that a lot, it's a really strong format um, decision to just have like the same opening every time. 
um, or the same ending. Like the Black Forager, she says, don't die after every video. And the more you can build in a couple of these like common patterns that you do at the beginning and at the end or in the middle, uh, a format, it makes it easier for you to create your series. Um, and, and then on the lighting, framing, and background stuff, that's, um, that's your, your production value. Um, you, can, you, know, you can do some hacks, um, you know, shoot during the day, uh, make sure, yeah, I mean, you can get really nerdy on all that stuff, but focus on, don't try to do the complicated stuff, do the easy stuff, I would say. All right, we got other stuff here. We got, I'm working on, Lauren says, I'm working on a doc right now about the sexual assault scandal at SFSU that effectively shut down the women's track team. That is juicy. That is a necessary doc. That's meaty. Um, I love it. And then we got start small. Okay. Okay, cool. Any Anybody else have roadblocks for making videos? All right, I'm going to move, keep it moving. All right, so all right, so let's just talk about the basic filmmaking process. And again, this you can get really in the weeds on each one of these. People can take years for each one of these um, steps in the process. I would, unless except for the person who's doing the, the documentary film, um, you, you may take that long on some of these things. But uh, for for most of the stuff that you guys are going to do, um, I would not spend a lot of time on any of these. You can, but but it's, it's helpful to think about it in these steps. So the first is the concept phase, and, and that can be um, collecting a collage of images or um, poetry, kind of like the, the previous pre presentation, uh, music, um, just things. What's, what's the inspiration? You're trying to get a sense of what is this about? What is the story that you're trying to tell? Why? Um, Especially for a documentary film, this could be a long process with lots of, um, you know, writing exercises, answering questions. Again, like a photo, an, one image, you know, or maybe it's like um, black and white. You know, that that that's setting a tone. You know, that's that's a part of the concept phase. What are the style choices that you want for this this video? And the next phase is is a script. So, Hannah, this is where it might be helpful for you to write just write out what you want to say, what do you want to communicate? And the writing process is about iterating, you know, you draft, then you come back, you you cut it down, and then you come back and you cut it down and you just keep whittling it away till you get to a very clear and concise statement that you want to articulate. And and so once you get that down, then you can just, you know, practice presenting it. Um, you know, the beautiful thing about a video production is it's not live. So you can you can make sure you get a good take, but the script is is can be important even for like a little TikTok video. Um, I think one of the one of the cooler formats that I've seen on TikTok is um, I, I ran out of time. I was going to try to do one, but uh, maybe I'll do one soon. It's where you you shoot yourself maybe wearing different outfits, talking to yourself um, as if you're different characters, um, and that's that's a great format where you would want to have a script so you've got dialogue. And you're, you know, maybe you only say like four lines, but uh, but it creates a dynamic. It creates a story. Um, then the next phase is going to be the production, where you're actually shooting. Um, uh, I, sorry, I got a little phase because somebody just got shot actually on a on a film production recently, literally by a gun. But um, uh, this is where you're going to, you know, capture your images. You're going to pull out your phone and do those recordings. And here I would advise to not, not take too much footage. The more stuff, and it's hard for a documentary filmmaker, but the, the more stuff that you compile, and it's very easy right now to, to compile a bunch of stuff, the more stuff you're going to have to deal with in the next phase of editing. Because you really want to be able to review all of that material multiple times and then start to pick the nuggets out. Um, so that's essentially the, the process of editing, again, it starts with reviewing all of the, the material you have. And the, the shorter and sweeter you have it, um, the easier that process will be. And then you are mixing and matching, putting this over here, that over there. Um, the process often starts with audio 
first, which is kind of counterintuitive. You want to think about your music. You want to think about your audio. Um, your, your, yeah, your audio first, and then you lay your imagery over the top. Um, and the term for that is called B-roll. And so, you know, like a, in a news, news industry, you're, you're going you're gonna to have your person talking, maybe it's a voiceover, and then you're going to have the camera person go and collect a bunch of, you know, short little snippet videos, and then you're going to layer those over the audio. So the, the, the imagery that you layer over your audio is, is always called B-roll. Um, all right, let's move on. So again, keep it simple, stupid. Um, another good phrase is uh, kill your darlings. But I just want to tell you a, a quick story about uh, keep it simple, stupid. Um, I, I have, I've been working on, a, on a, a documentary about housing for years now, and I don't think I'm ever going to finish it because I keep making it bigger and bigger and more complicated. Um, and most of the stuff that I've actually finished has been very small, bite-sized um, projects. So I, I highly recommend that you, that you don't take it too far. And, and so I, I have a, a story to tell you about that. There's a famous documentarian named Errol Morris. He's a brilliant documentary filmmaker. But his first film took him something like 10 years to complete. And somewhere down that process, uh, another famous filmmaker named Warner Herzog um, basically said, I will bet that Errol Morris will never finish that film. And if he does, I will eat my shoe. And so 10 years later, Errol Morris finally finished his film. And uh, Werner Herzog went to actually the UC Berkeley campus, met up with uh, Alice Waters, I think that's her name, um, the famous uh, California cook and uh, boiled his leather shoe and ate it. And uh, let me play you the video of that. I don't want to buy what? I don't want to buy what? $2! $2, sweetheart! I need to turn off this damn TV! TV. Heart attack, usually the end of the line for a workaholic. I'm glad you brought that up. Because if you switch on television, it's just uh, ridiculous and it's destructive. It kills us. And talk shows will, will kill us. They kill our language. So we have to declare holy war against uh, what we see every single day on television, commercials. And I think there should be... There should be real war against commercials, real war against talk shows, real war against Bonanza and Rawhide or all these uh, things. that cooking is the only alternative to filmmaking. Looks all very good, look at this. It should be like a pig's foot that um, gets served. It's always a little, uh, the leather should all soften up and to serve it with something like uh, the beans or a chili and lots of onions sprinkled on top. I didn't mean to, to eat this shoe uh, in public. I intended to, to eat it in a restaurant, but I was pushed a little bit into it, and it makes sense to some extent, because it should be an encouragement for all of you who want to make films and who are just scared to start and who haven't got the guts. So you can follow a good example. All right, um, and then I'm going to... That. I'm going to play you another quick little ditty. This is by Ira Glass, who's the, uh, the famous podcaster, This American Life. But he, he gets at this, um, well, you'll, you'll see. It, it, it's another encouraging piece to just tell you to get it done. Don't worry if it's crap um, and just keep doing it. So here we go.
somebody had told this to me is that um all of us who do creative work like you know we get into it and we get into it because we have good taste but it's like there's a gap that for the first couple years that you're making stuff what you're making isn't so good okay it's not that great it's, it's, it's trying to be good it has ambition to be good but it's not quite that good but your taste the thing that got you into the game your, your taste is still killer and your taste is good enough that you can tell that what you're making is kind of a disappointment to you you know what i mean a lot of people never get past that phase. A lot of people at that point, they quit. And the thing I would just like say to you with all my heart is that most everybody I know who does interesting creative work, they went through a phase of years where they had really good taste. They could tell what they were making wasn't as good as they wanted it to be. They knew it felt short. It didn't have this special thing that we wanted to have. And the thing I would say to you is everybody goes through that. And for you to go through it, if you're going through it right now, if you're just getting out of that phase, you got to know it's totally normal. And the most important possible thing you could do is do a lot of the work. Do a huge volume of work. Put yourself on a deadline so that every week or every month you know you're going to finish one story. Because it's only by actually going through a volume of work that you're actually going to ca catch up and close that gap. And your the work you're making will be as good as your ambitions. It takes a while. It's going to take you a while. It's normal to take a while, and you just have to fight your way through that. Okay? All right. Um, all right, we'll get back to this presentation here. So I don't know if, if people have feedback or thoughts on that piece of it while I get this set up here. Um, I'm going to jump through some practical tips now and I'm in um, presentation mode. So if you've got a chat or a question, just throw it out there. Let me know. All right, practical tips. So you want to focus on like a, if you notice um, a lot of the good series that you're watching on Netflix, um, a lot of the, the stuff that captures your attention, the way the way that storytellers capture your attention is they raise questions. They, 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 they create mystery. They, um, they, they make you ask the question continuously, what's going to happen next? I want to know more. The game you are playing is you are trying to keep people, keep people attending to or paying attention to your story. You don't want to lose them. You don't want to bore them. Um, and a great technique to do that is to raise questions, especially in the beginning. Um, create a scenario where you don't give all of the answers. Tease your audience. You want to dribble out information. Um, obviously, the uh, uh, you know the mystery format. Um, like uh, I've been watching Murder in the Building. I don't know if you guys have seen that. It's great. But you know that's a built-in format where it's like, who's the killer? Um, that that is a great technique. And so play with that technique as you, as you do your work. Even if it's a little TikTok video, um, you know, pose a question at the beginning and then don't answer it until the end. Um, all right, uh, let me get to the next thing here. Okay, so that leads to, to the, you know, the concept of a surprise. That is also just a great technique um, for, for having some sort of payoff at the end. So your answer could be a shocking answer. It could be not what, what was expected. You, you, you kind of, I find when I, when I try to formulate a story, I think backwards um, to, you know, I know what the ending is and I try to intentionally misdirect the starting of my story so that the ending is a surprise. And that's, 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 that makes for a good story. Um, if, if you notice stories that really hit you in your soul, um, it's often you're, you're going one way and then all of a sudden this happens at the end and, and it sticks with you. So it's kind of the same kind of concept as a punchline and a joke. Um, so, so this is another kind of way of, of thinking about your, your overall structure of your storytelling. Um, let's go to the next one. 
All right, so this is going to be a technical thing. I think if we still have our our uh, art students in the build in the in the here, they'll probably maybe know this, the photographers. But just take a look at this image here, and and the question is why? Why is this woman with the pink umbrella? Why is she so far over to the left side of the screen? Um, and and ask yourself what um, what would this? How would this image sit with you if she was centered in the center of the screen? Um, does this is this more interesting to you? Does this pique your curiosity to look at this this image? According to the the film buffs and the the film gurus and film class, this is the way that you should always frame your images. Um, it's called the rule of thirds. So let me take it to the next. So you can see if you break up any frame that you that you're when you're framing your your shots into thirds, you always if you notice. A lot of the times like when you're watching TV, the, the face is the most, most important thing for us as human beings. So the face is the important thing here. And we see that the woman's face is in not only the third, uh, one, the left side, left third of, of the frame, but, but also the top, her face is at the top left of the frame. So often you'll see framing where um, the eyes are you know, rather than right now, if you're looking at my screen, I'm in kind of the center. If this, if I was framed in a TV show or in a film, the, the cinematographer would probably put my eye on something like this, so that there's some stuff going over here. This is just kind of the standard film language. And if you do it, you will achieve that, that it will be one step to getting that high production value that I think Phoenix was talking about, is to frame things using the rule of thirds. Um, so put your your main subject in the third, both top and and and, and uh, vertically and, and horizontally. All uh, right. Um, and then on the subject of, of cinematography or framing, you know you want to think about your your close ups, your wides. Use that to tell your story. It's often it's also really just pleasant to to see varying uh, perspectives in in one one video. Um, or one film, so you know, play with with close and wide. Um, and this is something that I I'm not a I'm not a cinematographer. I'm not really a camera nerd. So I wish somebody told me this. But like, especially if you're going to do stuff with your phone, I kind of thought that you, you know, it's this magic technology te technology thing. You know, you just point it over here, point it over there, and it'll just do the rest. You, all that jitteriness is not going to make for good production value. It's not going to give you the right stuff to edit into a, a high quality um, video. So what you want to do is it's a, it's a really a, it's a physical exercise when you are taking your shots. And the best advice would just be to keep it slow and keep it steady. You know, in fact, even this is worse than I would say just if you can mount it on something and just have it be, you know, get one of those tripods or just just hold it still. Um, and then move, reposition, and get another shot. Still, that is more pleasant. We're, we're, more, we're, you know, unless you're doing like the Blair Witch Project, where that's part of your style, that shaky cam thing. Um, for the most part, it's better just get slow and steady shots. That will, those little details will definitely add to your production value. All right, so so let's get a little philosophical here. Um, the question is, what what makes art art? Um, and so I, I took a, a, an art theory class in college and, and this little like nugget stuck with me really well, um, which is, you know, the question is like, uh, you know, you take a toilet, you paint uh, some nail polish on it, somebody calls it art and it sells for a million dollars. And then somebody else goes, well, why is that art? What, what makes that art? So, you know, there's the, the art dealers, the, the museum people, there's this whole network of people that are involved in the the high art scene. But when you when you whittle all that down, the question is, what are the, what's the minimum set of ingredients? So maybe I'll pose this to you guys and, and, and let's see if you guys have any answers. What's the minimum set of ingredients to to, to have art be art? Like I'm I'm talking about, you know, you know, you need you need the thing to be created, the act of creation. How many people are involved? Does anybody want to throw out a guess? Okay, I'm seeing in the chat. 
Thank I don't you. really think there's a limit, uh, a requirement. It could be one person. It could be a group. Um, I'm thinking of, I can't remember, but a couple that would do a lot of art pieces. It's like pieces of cloth. Um, like on the, just like posted up in the environment. Um, yeah, so a photographer has a camera, but they're taking pictures of things that, you know, are kind of already in existence. Um, so I guess light might be an ingredient. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, awesome, Mitzi. Yeah, I think you're right on. So, so what, what we came to in, in, in that class was that you need, at minimum, you need one creator, one person to do the art. You need to, them to do that thing, whatever it is, whether it's you know a poem or a performance or whatever. And then you need an audience member or a viewer. So technically that could be two people, but Mitzi, you hit it. It can be one person. I can paint some nail polish on a toilet as the artist. I can take a walk around the block, come back, look at it and go, hey, that's art. And that meets the minimum requirement to be art. Now, you might say that's not art, but that doesn't matter. It's art. Um, so the reason I'm going into that is to say that you need to be your audience. You need to inhabit that space. And if the better you can do that, the better that you can take a break from, from what you just um, created and come into a different headspace and look at it with fresh eyes, the more you can edit it and make it something that's actually going to be engaging and pleasing and, and have the effect that you want. So you want to be your audience member. Um, and, and really that's, that's taking a break from your editing, from your writing, uh, from your creation process, coming back to it, then taking another break, coming back to it. This is, this is the story of, of good writing and it's the story of good editing and, and art creation, I would say. Um, yeah, especially editing, not, not, uh, not, not just art, you know, in general, but video editing is very similar to writing where you draft, you edit, you take a break, you come back, you edit, you come back, you edit. All right. Let's see, let's go to the next. Okay, and another, another practical tip is make sure that the sound is solid. That is a, a great way to kill your production value is if you have crappy sound, but beautiful images, it's counterintuitive. You would think that, you know, this is a, it's a visual medium that the images are the most important thing. That's not the case. It's actually the sound. If you have strong sound and crappy images, you will still have something that feels like a, a high production value um, video um, or film. Uh, I remember I used to work at movie theaters. I worked at three different movie theaters uh, as a, as a young person, and I remember some grizzled old manager smoking a cigarette outside of the, uh, the trash compactor when I was in high school, and he said, as long as you make sure the sound works, that's all they care about. That's true. Um, so think about your music, but also think about your, your audio recording. Make sure you invest in a good mic, or if you're, if you're doing something, um, you know, if you're doing a TikTok thing on your phone, that's totally fine, but Try to figure out how to shoot, say, indoors so that you don't have a ton of wind so that you can get good, clean audio. All right. All right, so um, I'm not sure what, where we are with time here. I guess I kind of cruised through. This, this is basically the end of my, my presentation. I have a little video I can show you guys if you want that I did. But um, I wanted to sh talk to you about uh, this, another brilliant, uh, author or book that I think everybody should read called The Inevitable, which is about, you know, if you want to predict what's going to happen in the future, read this book. It came out a couple years ago and it talks about a number of technological shifts that are coming, like, um, you know, the idea of making everything smart, you know, from your refrigerator to just like in the past, we would, you know, take a, a drill, a screwdriver and electrify it. And that, you know, you electrify it everything now the next wave is is just making everything smart make your fridge smart make your drill smart everything will be made smart um, but he also talks about where we're going with the video um, language and what he predicts is already happening which is that we will have newer way newer and newer ways to take 
pop culture references, a little song, a little quote from this film, and mash them all together to create very quickly um, effective ways of communicating. And that's already happening on TikTok and on YouTube. And uh, so I just wanted to kind of plant that seed for you that this is this is an evolving form. Um, and you know, if we look back 10 years from now, I think the way that we communicate will be will be a lot different. Um, and um, it will it will basically what he's talking about is this idea of format and and borrowing little snippets and models. And I think Tic Tac, uh, sorry, TikTok is a great uh, example of that. That's if you serve around TikTok, a lot of what is done there is taking one little snippet of a song um, or just audio, weird audio that somebody did, and then somebody else putting their little spin on it. Um, so just think about that. Um, again, think about what your format is that you're going to always, always use for all of your videos. I think it's a great technique. I do that. I have a podcast and I do that. I have the same intro and the same outro and then I change the middle every time. Um, and you could do th think about your series like that. Uh, but, but also you can think about in the TikTok world, trying to apply your video, say on, on mushroom remediation to whatever the latest um, thing is that, that's on TikTok. Uh, you know, there's the, uh, the clock thing people do different spins on that. There's, there's the uh, you know, being inhabiting multiple characters as the same person style. There's, you'll notice a couple different models if you just surf through TikTok and play with that. Play with that and borrow. Borrow, borrow, borrow. Um, all right, so I, the last thing is uh, I did a little video on my phone. I went to Brazil uh, for a month, a couple years ago. And, um, and then I edited like a 15 minute film. So I'll play it for you if you guys want, uh, but I don't have to bore you with it. Um, I, I could also open it. Why don't I open it up to questions first uh, and, then, and then see who's the next. So any, any questions, thoughts? Adam? Yes. Okay, good job. Good job. Thank you. I made I made two I made two observations. I made two observations while you were presenting. Okay. One that uh, just recently you showed, which is the rule of thirds. Yeah. Uh the space that was left on the right side of the screen. Is that telling us there is more to come? I think I saw Makita writing, she says, uncovering this space. Is that what that is? That, uh, that gives the impression that there's still more to come. When you move subject matter to the palette, is that correct? Um, yeah, I think, I think that's a great interpretation of that. Yeah, it, 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 it piques your interest, you're, you're, you're like, you know, it's a little, your, your eye is kind of confused maybe a little bit because you want it to be, that character to be centered. So you see them over to one side and then you're like, you're, you're curious about what's going on over there on the, on the empty space. Uh, it creates engagement. It's a way to, um, to keep the, the audience interested. It's a, it's, a, it's a, you could say it's a cheap technique, but the other thing is um, it's kind of what our eyes expect now. So if you don't do it, that's fine, but know that you're doing that. You're you're, you're changing the typical way that somebody wants is used to looking at an image. Second observation, quickly, is early part of the uh, presentation where you were showing uh, how production is done. Uh, you did show. Uh, let me try to find it. Uh, uh, when you got to production and shooting. And I think at that point you did mention about a recent film that was being produced and somebody was shot. I think I saw it on the news this morning. It was a Western. That means that at the very part where the shooting, production and shooting is going, they did not take time or detail somebody 
go through all the ops, make sure they are functioning right. Because they did not know that the gun was loaded with live ammunition. It was planned. That means somebody did not do their job at the last minute, which caused the life of that lady uh, actress. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I apologize for bringing that up. I just, it just it hit my brain when I said shooting. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that highlights, you know, th these things are highly planned projects. Planning is always good. Um, and in this case, it, it would have, better planning would have saved this woman's life. Um, but, but yeah, uh, it's, it, you know, it also reminds me that it, it's a very physical, it's a physical thing. I have a friend who's a, um, a, a professional camera, camera person shoots documentaries all the time. It's a physical, it's a, it's an athletic event. Um, you know, we don't, we don't re usually realize that. Okay. I think we got time for uh, one more question maybe, or, uh, I will put a link to my little video in the chat if you guys want to check it out. All right. I think, I think that's it then. Thank you guys for, for listening. Take Thank care. you.